Okay, so uh, thanks very much to the organizers for having me. It was, was a lot of fun to look at these uh, very nice uh, presentations and uh, actually think about the bodies of work that they come from. Uh, so for the most part, uh, Ken and Atif follow distinct approaches where Ken kind of focuses on these, these uh, long time series of aggregate data on booms and crises and then studies the co-movement in these aggregate time series, whereas Atif collects disaggregated regional uh, data on boom-bust episodes, and then it's about co-movement in the cross-section of regions. And I agree with Alan that uh, these are complementary, and they're also uh, useful for different questions. So say I had a, a model that emphasizes some behavioral force that's relevant across different institutional settings, uh, such as uh, how does learning over boom-bust cycles affect risk perception? then I'd want to confront that model with Ken's facts. Um, and uh, what the model would be good if it can get this co-movement in the time series. Whereas if I have a very specific question about, say, credit supply uh, and uh, regulation in the last crisis in the US, then I want to confront that with Atif's facts. Uh, and it's good if it, if it gets the co-movement in the cross-section. Um, in both cases, then, uh, the model would have to handle these common themes that uh, basically bad shocks hit borrowers harder if there's lots of debt. And then there's these persistent effects of uh, debt overhang and default. Now, what I want to do in this discussion is uh, expand on points that came up in both of the uh, presentations, uh, which is that debt is a claim that's denominated in a unit of account as risky. Uh, and I want to ask, how does a unit of account matter and how is it chosen? So. Uh, we think usually of, of debt as a safe asset. So there's a large literature on kind of debt as an optimal contract that identifies ex ante benefits from claims that have uh, few or costly contingencies. And there was some discussion of these, these uh, this morning. Um, and then in macro applications, uh, leverage amplifies shocks because uh, th this debt has few contingencies. Uh, and this all works in models with one good. Right? And safety is then about the payoff profile in this one good. But now in a world with many goods, what is debt then? Well, uh, it's still a promise that's got few or costly contingencies, uh, but the promise is denominated in some unit of account, say a dollar, and uh, then you can have uh, debt revaluation if the relative price of the unit of account changes, and that leads to redistribution between borrowers and lenders. And so again, the questions are now, this, what is the role of this revaluation and redistribution uh, holding fixed the unit of account, and then how is the unit of account chosen? Um, so it, uh, to start with the first question, we got to talk about nominal debt, because in modern economies, uh, basically government debt is the dominant unit of account, and then uh, inflation changes the real value of nominal debt, and uh, there's wealth effects. Uh, inflation is good for borrowers and bad for lenders. Um, it's useful to uh, distinguish two types of revaluation shocks. We could have an unanticipated increase in the nominal price level that leads to the same percentage drop in all the real positions, uh, in all the nominal positions, sorry. Um, and we could have uh, unanticipated news about future uh, price level increase. And that basically makes the nominal yield curve shift up and then bond prices and the value of uh, future promises fall. Uh, and that typically leads to long-term fixed-rate positions getting devalued more than short-term positions. Now, uh, with uh, government debt as the dominant unit of account, uh, it's important that inflation is not just some cheap way for the government to add contingencies to its own debt, but uh, also that there's all these redistribution effects uh, via private contracts that use the same unit of account. Um, so how do we uh, measure this? Uh, so for nominal positions, uh, we'd like to integrate kind of sectoral accounts that help us think about government versus other sectors uh, with uh, household surveys. Um, and so for the U.S. in recent years, it turns out that net positions by sector are uh, moderate because there's a lot of offsetting asset and liability positions. For example, in intermediary balance sheets, uh, but also uh, the government has both debt and uh, has pension funds. And then uh, households uh, who own... Uh, equity stakes have indirect debt uh, through, through their business ownership. And then after consolidation of these things, uh, it's basically all the, the rest of the world lends to the U.S. government. Um, the household sector has a relatively small net position, 
but it still has large growth positions. Okay? So uh, that those come mostly from uh, housing. So the, the old uh, rich lend to the uh, young middle class. Okay? Um, so example, uh, thought experiment. Suppose we had announced 5% more inflation per year over 10 years in 2014. Um, that would lead uh, at the sectoral level to a gain of 10% of GDP uh, by the government at the expense of the rest of the world, with the households approximately even. But at the same time, there'd be this winning coalition of households that, that gain 25% of GDP uh, at, the ex at the extent of the lender households. Um, and then now, uh, as we, th there's similar order of magnitude uh, have been found for other countries where this, this integration of accounts has, has been done. More generally, as we're getting uh, better data on uh, individual positions, we can sort of do more there. And there's uh, now uh, more kind of measurement of exposure to inflation and nominal interest rate risk, uh, not only for government debt, which is a literature that has a, has a long tradition, but also now for interest rate risk in financial institutions using uh, bank level data. Um, it'd also be nice, uh, in addition to just documenting these, these positions, uh, to directly measure the short-run response to revaluation shocks. Um, th that's difficult because you need to, to find a clean shock. Uh, so there's literature on kind of interest rate changes and inequality, um, but those, of course, work through various channels, redistribution being one of them, similarly for shocks to inflation expectations. So there, the, the, the message of, of how large are these things is, is not so clear. Sometimes there is a, is a great uh, experiment that one could look at, such as the draw market paper of a chief student, uh, Emil Werner, who had this uh, exchange rate change that revalued foreign uh, currency debt uh, in Hungary. Um, the, the other way that we can kind of get, try to get some clean uh, a view of uh, how these effects matter is by studying just the aggregate effects of revaluation in quantitative models. And there, uh, what we're learning is that the interaction of uh, these uh, revaluation effects with financial frictions are uh, uh, generate interesting quantitative uh, versions of what Irving Fisher had been talking about. Um, and th that, that has led some people to argue one should think ab harder about things like price level targeting and nominal in income targeting that, uh, that uh, deal with this uh, sort of real value of, uh, of normal positions more directly. So uh, my takeaway from for the first question is that these uh, revaluation and distribution effects uh, because of the risky unit of account are things that are, that are relevant and, uh, and uh, matter for, for macroeconomic dynamics. So that raises now the second question, which is uh, what determines the unit of account? Why is it that everything's in dollars? Okay. So a cheap answer might be, well, that, that's just because it's convenient. So the, let's have the unit of account equal to the medium of exchange in which we settle the contracts. Okay. Um, and it's true that today government debt in many countries uh, serves both ro roles. Okay. Historically, however, uh, the two roles are, uh, the, the two functions are disconnected often. Um, and the starkest example of this are these accounting currencies, uh, which are distinct from any existing medium of exchange. So a historical example is the livre tournois, which uh, was at one point a coin in medieval France, but then it stopped circulating. Nevertheless, for more than 100 years, was still used as an accounting currency. <laughs> and contracts were denominated in that. Um, so it, wor it then worked sort of like the ECU uh, in uh, 1990s Europe. Um, Another stylized fact is that uh, there's often a common unit of account in areas with intensive trade. So the uh, Vereinsthaler, which is the, was the currency of Prussia, um, was uh, used as to write contracts in uh, 19th century northern Germany, um, which had these many small uh, states. So you had many currency used for payment and settlement, but uh, contracts mostly in this uh, Vereinsthaler. Okay, sort of like uh, a lot of uh, contracting is in the US dollar today. Um, now, government debt as a, as a unit of account is something that uh, has become more common more recently, as governments tended also to borrow more, uh, except, of course, when the value of the government debt is too uncertain. So we have dollarization as a uh, phenomenon as well. So to think about that, uh, uh, Dupkin and I um, wrote this environment with contracting frictions and multiple goods, where the candidates of the unit of account are goods or assets that are traded in spot markets. So you can quote a value. And then we characterize a second best network of contracts. 
And so the, roughly the, the, the argument is that there's three features of modern economies that lead to a dominant unit of account. The first one is that there's some benefit from non-contingent promises or costly default. And so that's uh, basically like in the uh, literature on debt as an optimal contract. And in this context here, it says that the unit of account should co-move with borrower income uh, in order to avoid default. So basically, if, you, if income is in kronas, then you better borrow in kronas, uh, not in pesos. Um, second uh, element is that there's gains from trade along credit chains. Which here we, we borrow from uh, Kiyotaki and Moore. And in our context, this says that the, there should be a common unit of account in chains to avoid mismatches of assets and liabilities along the chain. Okay. So if lending the Swedes, uh, and then Swedes will get income in krona, you better borrow in krona. So then everything propagates <coughs> along the chain. Um, now finally, uh, the third element is that these credit chains are formed uh, by random matching. Um, and that generates a dominant unit of account in the economy that uh, minimizes the cost of mismatches everywhere. So there, basically, if lending could be to either Swedes or the Mexicans, you borrow in the unit of account with the lowest expected cost of mismatch, not necessarily the krona or the peso itself. Okay. Soccer fans will appreciate why I worry, uh, as a German, worry strongly about Sweden and Mexico right now. <laughs> the, so this, this gets us a story for why there's a dominant unit. Now, what is it? Uh, well, basically, it's chosen to minimize the expected cost of mismatch of assets and income uh, and liabilities uh, in these credit chains. And this means that it depends on um, both matching risk, how does this matching process work, and relative price risk. And the basic principles are that it should co-move with the assets and income of likely borrowers, important borrowers, and it should be relatively stable in value. Um, so to revisit these, these historical things, now, when, when would we expect government debt? Well, if the government's a prominent borrower, and if uh, government debt's uh, value is not uh, too volatile. Um, here, what matters is debt, not whether it's, uh, uh, the debt is used as a medium of exchange. Okay, so it's overall government borrow. Uh, second, uh, we'd expect that there's choice of uh, common unit of accounts in areas of intensive trade. And then that would be uh, currencies of relatively large countries that are not too volatile, so Prussia, US, etc. The model also says that uh, the use of a dominant unit is something that's more valuable if the economy is more complex in the sense that there's longer chains and there's more sort of mixing of relatively heterogeneous agents. And so that lets, that lets me think that this coordination on a dominant unit of account is something that's going to increase. Um, and uh, I'm, there's a, sort of this recent uh, uh, evidence and theory on the dollar as a worldwide unit of account that I'm very excited about that looks at these issues more. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin. Uh, before uh, allowing questions, I will actually use my position as a chair to make a small comment uh, on the headline uh, about the Riksbank uh, <laughs> the, that we saw. I don't think we should jump to conclusions from that headline because there is indication that the Riksbank and other authorities concerned in Sweden are jumping to conclusions. And what we saw from ATIF was a careful analysis of the reasons behind the increase in household debt. And both, uh, both uh, uh, ATIF and, uh, and uh, Alan emphasized the role of, of a credit supply shock. There is no indication that Swedish household debt is growing because of supply shocks. Lending standards have been high and increasing over the years. So the reason debt is growing is uh, because of demand, uh, uh, essentially increasing housing demand and, and completely insufficient supply. So one shouldn't jump from, uh, to conclusions from a, what is a correlation to what is causality. Anyhow, this is not the topic <laughs> of, 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 of this. Uh, let me start with Marty here. Uh, just a, a quick comment on uh, Atif's work, which is, I think is wonderful. But, but I think it's, Atif mentioned this very briefly, but I want to bring it back to macro, which is if you think about how to get big macro effects that aren't perverse in terms of movements across cross sectors, et cetera, most of the theories that we have, I don't know of any exceptions, but there may be in development, you need some kind of nominal frictions which translate 
this into big macro effects. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's an important challenge. That's an important challenge. If you don't buy into those nominal frictions, uh, so someone cited Larry's wonderful paper with Moton Rostano. If you just have a Fisher deflation channel, you don't get much out of it. You just basically get a redistribution, and that's that. So that's an important channel to the extent, an important challenge to the extent one's not comfortable with financial frictions. Okay, let me take one more uh, question, uh, Olivia. So a remark on uh, public and, and private debt. At the end of a financial crisis, there's a lot of debt everywhere. There's high leverage and high debt. And uh, the question is, suppose you could reallocate the debt exposed in the way that would maximize the return of the economy to health and, and further growth. And it seems to me here that there's a very strong argument for wanting the government to actually take much of the debt and the effect of leverage, a flow of, of high leverage on banks is very high in terms of what they, the effects they have on the economy. Atif showed that you know, on households, high debt is a big issue. So exposed, it looks as if there's a lot of arguments for actually wanting to shift the debt and maybe have bailouts and debt restructuring of households and so on. Now, ex ante, clearly, this is going to have a lot of adverse incentive effects, uh, moral hazard and so on. But it seems to me that there is a tension here which we have to think about, which is maybe the exposed uh, aspect is sufficiently important that we should be willing to actually consider bailouts and, uh, and debt restructuring of households more than we are at this stage. It seems to me there is an argument these days for not having bailouts of any form, and that seems too extreme to me. Okay, let's uh, have Atif and Ken the chance to respond to the first two questions. <coughs> thanks. Um, first of all, thanks to the uh, discussants. I really enjoyed it. And um, of course, I should have been much more muted uh, regarding Bank of Sweden's statement. Um, <laughs> in, in, in response to Marty's uh, uh, comment, I think that's an excellent uh, point. Uh, it is, in terms of the theoretical models that we have, um, it is um, um, a question. I, I think it's an open question of which friction is the most relevant one to empirically kind of give us the magnitudes that we tend to see in the, in, in the data. Um, Amir and I are not theorists, so we see that as a useful uh, challenge for the much more competent people in this, in this room. Uh, but of course, people have talked about things like monetary policy constraints. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, wage rigidity. Um, there are other uh, uh, possibilities uh, as well, uh, difficulty of shifting demand from one area uh, to another for, 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 for potentially other uh, reasons. Um, but again, I think that's, that's, that's clearly uh, an important open question going forward. Olivia's question, uh, remark on government, that's, th that's, first of all, that's exactly right. Exposed, you would uh, tend to get that implication that if you could move these things over to a an entity, essentially, that doesn't s suffer from debt overhang. That's the kind of the idea to boost up aggregate demand. That would e exactly uh, improve things. Um, having said that, as Olivia also pointed out, uh, from an ex-ante perspective, that raises uh, concerns. It's for kind of those kind of reasons, those kind of trade-offs that when Amir and I, we wrote the book, we, we, our first best was to think more about ex ante and state contingent uh, contracts. So that's kind of the avenue that we favor and we kind of talk about it in the book. <coughs> um, uh, thanks for the comments. Let me just pick up on a, <coughs> a couple things. Alan mentioned sovereign immunity. Actually, Bulo and I have a whole section on this in our 1989 JP paper and I followed it at least through 2003, most uh, borrowing contracts contain waivers of sovereign immunity. So it, you know, it doesn't matter what the law is. And to Olivier's comment, uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think that's what Reinhardt and I argued at every moment, that uh, the public sector should take over the private sector debts in the case of Europe. Uh, we argued for write downs of the debt in the southern countries, uh, capitalized, uh, re having to recapitalize the banks off the uh, German and French balance sheets. And in the US, uh, we argued, uh, as a, 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 a Mian and Sufi did, uh, for trying to use public sector funds to bail out the, the uh, housing sector. And I, d I don't know like a politically correct quite analogy to this, but so this won't be. But if you have a stockpile of weapons, uh, you're not trying to keep them uh, if uh, you're being attacked, uh, 
because you might have another war. That's sort of the time you want to use them. Uh, and uh, that, that's a very different proposition, uh, of course. Okay, uh, John? I thought the empirical stuff that he put up was quite convincing, in particular the boom-bust uh, pictures, where you have kind of a three-year uh, cycle. And that would mean that if you're explaining 2008, you've got to go back to look at 2003, 4, 5. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just thought about that. Uh, but, but second, uh, I'm very interested in the – clearly you need some kind of rigidities, like Marty was saying, but that lag is quite long. I don't know if you've thought about how you're actually going to do that with, with the kind of models we've been working with and need a completely new model or what. Okay. One more question, please. Yeah, you. Um, thank you. I also wanted to uh, make a plug for thinking um, harder about how expectations um, contribute to these boom and bust cycles. And you know, in the in the context of thinking about you know why the lags look the way they lag, they look because it really matters whether we have a um, credit expansion that is an exogenous shock to credit standards or whether it's endogenous driven driven by uh, changing beliefs. And some of my research suggests that actually beliefs really matter. So for example, if you look over the, you know, the, the years before the 2008 crisis, actually we saw no change in the LTV distribution in the US. But we saw a big increase across the board in the DTI um, levels, right? Which suggests that in a way banks, um, like everybody else, very passively seem to have expanded lending against increasing Vs, um, not taking into account that potentially these values are overvalued. And so I think that, you know, this goes back to your comment about the, the Reichsbank in Sweden. Maybe you do need to be worried actually right now, not because the standards are falling, but maybe, you know, who knows how long and sustainable um, the, the asset prices will be at a level that they are. And I, I think that's quite important for, for um, regulation as well. That's a very relevant comment, but there is no evidence that <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, 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 is no, there is no evidence that housing prices, uh, housing is overvalued in Sweden. If, if anything, it looks to be a bit undervalued. But, but anyway, <laughs> le, 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 I, I should let the speakers uh, respond. Well, for, first of all, I, I promise I will not talk about Sweden uh, again, <laughs> ever again. Um, <laughs> Uh, John Taylor's uh, question about the lags, uh, th that's a very interesting question. Um, there's actually an, a very nice uh, recent uh, paper by Korinek and co-authors from the BIS, I believe, where they kind of take our results and they explain the lag structure that we find in the data. And their point basically is that if you take the average amortization um, um, or, or duration of the, of the mortgages that are issued and you look at the implied uh, timing of the debt service burden. That explains essentially this lead lag structure that we see. So in, in other words, it's when the weight of the debt service burden is, is, hits the, is the strongest, that's when GDP starts to decline. So it's really about the flow. So they break out the stock flow relationship basically to explain the lead lag structure and that, that, that might be important. Um, Antoinette's uh, um, uh, comment on expectations, uh, clearly expectations are very important. Um, in fact, one reason, I think Jeremy um, has a paper where they're uh, kind of uh, making this, this, this point, expectations could be one of the factors that drive credit supply uh, in the first place. So for example, if lenders maybe uh, uh, for, for uh, non-credible reasons believe that you know, the risks are not there, neglect the risks or whatever, that could be a justification for an expansion in credit supply, among other things. I, I if I can add something, I would just uh, quickly underscore uh, Raghu Rajan's comments about the pro-cyclical nature of everything that can be regulation, uh, fiscal policy. One of the miracles of modern central banking is it's less so, uh, maybe thanks to very uh, people with very high conviction, like yourself, uh, you know, at the banks. But that's been most things are very pro-cyclical, and it's not that easy to put it down. You can pass a law, but then 
say, Donald Trump can appoint people that don't enforce the law. And that happens all the time, everywhere. So it's very hard to abstract completely from political economy factors and these issues. Okay, I think there is only room for one time for one question. Matthias, please. Or, or, or were you before? Okay, the one question then. If you, it was just with a short comment that um, it's a sh it's a it's a shame we haven't done what Olivier recommended very often, which in times when we get this great debt overhang, that debt isn't forgiven. So I just want to remind people that in the two in two thousand eight, um, many people recommended um, writing down some of the subprime mortgage debt. And uh, in fact, 17 hedge funds who were the ones holding the debt recommended <laughs> writing it down. <laughs> so you wouldn't even need a government bailout in order to write it down. They just didn't have the power to write it down. And so this is a remedy that we seem all too, all, not often enough to use. Final I agree. response. <laughs> John wrote a good paper back then, I'll just add. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone, uh, time for coffee.